The royal declaration concerning lawful source on the Sunday. Not many paces after the king had marched the duke of kingdom, then in the zenith of his power, and in all perfection of his only beauty, eclipsing all the rest of the nobles in splendor or apparel, as he did in the stateliness of his own portal lane, returning the salutation that made him, which was scarcely less reverential than those addressed to the monarch himself, the prime favourite moved on all eyes following his majestic figure in the door. Buckingham walked alone, as if he had been a prince of the blood, but after him came a throng of nobles. The Earl of Hembrook, High Chamberlain, Duke of Richmond, Master of the Household, the Earl of Nottingham, Lord High Admiral, Viscount Rashley, Lord Howard of Effingham, Lord Zouch, President of Wales, the Lords Norris, Mordor, Compton, and Grey of Robin, one or two of the noblemen seemed inclined to question Richard as to what had passed between him and the King of the Man in reserve and a somewhat stern man to deter them next king, Judge Dodrich, Cook, and Lord Howard, Counter and enforce gravity, for if any day be placed in the mood can keep and portly persons, they will not be disordered to self-indulgence and conviviality. After the judges came the Bishop of Chester, the King's Chaplain, who had officiated on the present occasion, and who was in his own pontical world, he was accompanied by the Lord of the Mansion, Sir Richard Hogan, a hale and handsome mansion, with the ends of his silvery hair, and a beard and broad and put manly person, a fresh complexion, and features by no means wanting many more dissimilarity to those of his son, the King's scandalous jest, a crowd of baronets and knights succeeded to lose Sir Arthur Cattle, Sir Thomas Brudenell, Sir Edward Montague, Sir Edmund Trafford, Sheriff of County, Sir Edward Morsley, and Sir Ralph Ashton. The latter looked grave and anxious, and as he passed his relatives said in his low tone to Richard, I am told Alison is to be here today. Is it so? She is replied to him, and why do you pass? Is she in danger? If so, let her be warned against him. On no account by Sir Ralph, that would only increase the suspicion already attached to her. No, she must face the danger, and I hope Ceremoniously to them, McCarthy did the same, not so, Master Potts. Halting for a moment, he said with a spiteful look, Look to yourself, Master Nicholas, and you too, Master Richard. A day of reckoning is coming for both of you. And with this, he sprang nimbly after his client. What means the fellow? cried Nicholas. But that we are here, as it were, in the precincts of a palace, I would after him and cudgel him soundly for his insolence. And what's that ye after, dinging man? cried a sharp voice behind him. No, that her feckless body that has just skipped after. If say you'll take a rank so by the look, and I counsel you to let him buy for his high high favour with the king. Turning at this address, Nicholas recognised the king's jester, Archie Armstrong, a merry little canade with light blue eyes, long yellow hair hanging about his ears, and a sandy beard. There was a great deal of mother wit about Archie, and quite as much shrewdness as folly. He wore no distinctive dress as jester, bauble, and coxcomb, having long been discontinued, but was simply clad in the royal livery and the sword. Master Potts is in favour with his majesty, eh? Archie asked the squire, hoping to obtain some information from him. And say what you the day before yesterday, when you hunted at my school, replied Jester. But how have I for you by the king's good opinion? asked Nicholas. Come, you are a good fellow, Archie, and will tell me. Dinner think to fletch me, man, replied the Jester, cunningly. I can what I can, and that's mine, and you'll get brought me with a your searing. The king's secrets are safe with Archie, and for a good reason. That he is never told them. You're a good huntsman, and say is his majesty. But there can game he likes better than any other, and that's to be found mostly in these parts. I mean witches and such like fearful carly. We mourn have the country rid of them, and that's what his majesty intends. And if you're a wise man, you'll lend him a helping hand. But I mourn into this too, and with this. 
Miss the jester gave it off, leaving Nicholas like one stupid. He was roused, however, by a smart slap on the shoulder from Sir John Finney. What? Pondering over the masquerade, Master Nicholas, or thinking of the petition you have to present to His Majesty, cried the master of the ceremonies. Let neither trouble you, the one will be well played, I doubt not, and the other well received, I am sure, for I know the king's sentiments on the subject. But touching the dame, Master Nicholas, have you found one willing and able to take part in the masquerade? I have found several willing, Sir John, replied Nicholas, but as to their ability, that is another question. However, one of them may do as a makeshift. They are all in the base court and shall wait on you when you please, and then you can make your election. So far, well, replied Finney. It may be that we shall have Ben Johnson here today. Rare Ben, the Prince of Poets and Masquerade Writers. Sir Richard Horton expects him. Ben is preparing a Masquerade for Christmas to be called a vision of delight in which His Highness the Prince is to be a principal actor, and some verses which have been recited to me are amongst the daintiest ever indicted by the bard. It will be a singular pleasure to me to see him, said Nicholas, for I hold Ben Johnson in the highest esteem as a poet. I owe them all, unless he will Shakespeare. Aye, you do well to accept Shakespeare, rejoined Sir John Finney. Great as Ben Johnson is, and for wit and learning no man surpasses him. He is not to be compared with Shakespeare, who, for profound knowledge of nature and of all the highest qualities of dramatic art, is unapproachable. But ours is a learned court, Master Nicholas, and therefore we have a learned poet. But a right good fellow is Ben Johnson, and a boon companion, though somewhat prone to sarcasm, as you will find if you drink with him. Over his cups he will reign at courts and courtiers in good set terms, I promise you, and I myself have come in for his guise. However, I love him nonetheless for his quips, for I know it is his humour to utter them, and so overlook what in another and less deserving person I should assuredly resent. But is not that young man who is now going for your cousin, Richard Ashton? I thought so. The king has had a strange tale whispered in his ear that a youth has been bewitched by a maiden, Alison Nutter. I think she is named, of whom he is en amoured. I know not what truth may be in the charge, but the youth himself seems to warrant it, for he looks ghastly ill. A letter was sent to his majesty at my school, communicating this and certain other particulars with which I am not acquainted, but I know they relate to some professors of the black art in your country, and the soil of which seems favourable to the growth of such noxious weeds. At first he was much disturbed by it, but in the end decided that all parties should be brought hither without being made aware of his design, that he might see and judge for himself in the matter. Accordingly, a messenger was sent over to Middleton Hall, as from Sir Richard Horton, inviting the whole family to the tower, and giving Sir Richard Ashton to understand it was the king's pleasure he should bring with him a certain young damsel named Alison Nutter, of whom mention had been made to him. Sir Richard had no choice but to obey, and promised compliance with his majesty's injunctions. An officer, however, was left on the watch, and this very morning reported to his majesty that young Richard Ashton had already set out with the intention of going to Preston, but had passed the night at Walton Dale, and that Sir Richard, his daughter Dorothy, and Alison Nutter would be here before noon. His majesty has laid his plans carefully, replied Nicholas, and I can easily conjecture from whom he received the information, which is as false as it is malicious. But are you aware, Sir John, upon what evidence the charge is supported? For mere suspicion is not enough. In cases of witchcraft, suspicion is enough, replied the knight gravely. Slender proofs are required. The girl is the daughter of a notorious witch. That is against her. The young man is ailing. That is against her too. But a witness, I believe, will produce so who I cannot say. Gracious heavens, what wickedness there must be in the world when such a charge can be brought against one so good and so unbending, cried Nicholas. A maiden more devout than Alison never existed. No one told in the crime. She is charged with greater abhorrence. She injured Richard. She would lay down her life for him, and would have been his wife. But for scruples of most delicate and disinterested on her part, but we will establish her innocence before his majesty and confound her enemies. It is with that hope that I have given you this information, sir, of which I am sure you will make no improper use, replied Sir John. I have heard a similar character to that you have given Alison. I am unwilling she should fall a victim to art or malice. Be upon your guard to Master Nicholas, for other investigations will take place at the same time, and some matters may come forth in which you are concerned. The king's arms are long and reach and strike far, and his eyes see clearly 
day when not to wink or when other people see for him and now go sir you must want breakfast here Farrington he had to an attendant sure master Nicholas Ashton to his lodging in the base court and attend upon him as if he were your master I will come for you sir when it is time to present a petition to the king so saying he bowed and walked forth turning into the quadrangle while Nicholas followed Farrington into the lower court where he found his friends waiting for him speedily ascertaining where their lodgings were situated, Barrington led them to a building on the left almost opposite to the great bonfire, and ascending a flight of steps ushered them into a commodious and well-furnished room looking into the court. This done he disappeared, but soon afterwards returned with two eon men of the kitchen, one carrying a tray of provisions upon his head, and the other sustaining a basket of wine under his arm, and a snowy napkin being laid upon the table. Trenchers, viands, and flasks were soon arranged in very tempting order, so tempting indeed that the squire, notwithstanding his assertion, that his appetite had been taken away, fell to work with his customary vigour, and piled a flask of excellent odour so incessantly that another had to be placed before him. Sherborne did equal justice to the good cheer, and Richard not only forced himself to eat, but to the squire's great surprise, swallowed more than one deep draught of wine. Having thus administered to the wants of the guests, and seeing his presence was no longer either necessary or desired, Barrington vanished, first promising to go and see that all was got ready for them in the sleeping apartment. Notwithstanding the man's civility, there was an over-faciousness about him that made Nicholas suspect he was placed over them by Sir John Finney to watch their movements, and he resolved to be upon his guard. I am glad to see you drink, lad, he observed to Richard, as soon as they were alone. A cup of wine will do you good. Do you think so? replied Richard, filling his goblet anew. I want to get back my spirits and strength to sustain myself, no matter how to look well. Ha <laughs> ha. If I can only make this frail machine carry me stoutly through the king's visit, I care not how soon it falls to pieces. Afterwards. I see your motive, replied Nicholas. You ought to turn away suspicion from Alison by this device, but you must not go to excess, or you will be your scene. I will do something to convince the king he is mistaken in me that I am not bewitched, cried Richard, rising and striding across the room. Bewitched, and by Alison too. I could laugh at the charge, but it is too horrible. Had any other than the king breathed, I would have slain him. His majesty has been abused by the malice of that knavish attorney, Hart, who has always manifested the greatest hostility towards Alison, said Nicholas. But he will not prevail, for she has only to show herself to dispel all prejudice. You are right, Nicholas cried Richard, and yet the king seems already to have prejudged her, and his obstinacy may lead to her destruction. Speak not so loudly, in heaven's name, said the squire in alarm. These walls may have ears, and echoes may repeat every word you utter. Then let them tell the king that Alison is innocent, cried Richard, stopping and replenishing his goblet. Here's to her health, and confusion to her enemies. I'll drink that toast with pleasure, Dick, replied the squire, but I must forbid you, Mark. Wine. You are not used to it, and the fumes will mount to your brain. Come and sit down beside us, that we may talk, said Sherborne. Richard obeyed, and leaning over the table, asked in a lordly tone, Where is Mistress Nutter, Nicholas? The squire looked toward the door before he answered, and then said, I will tell you. After the destruction of Malkin Tower and the band of robbers, she was taken to a solitary hut near Barley Boo at the foot of Pendle Hill, and the next day it was conveyed across Fallen Forest to Halton in the Fly, on the borders of Morton Bay, with the intention of getting her on board some vessel bound for the Isle of Man. Arrangements were made for this purpose, but when the time came, she refused to and was brought secretly back to the hut near Barley, where she has been ever since. Though her place of concealment was hidden even from you and her daughter, the captain of the robbers, Fog or Demdy, escaped, did he not, said Richard. I, in the confusion occasioned by the blowing up of the tower, he managed to get away, replied Nicholas, and we were unable to follow him, as our attentions had to be bestowed upon Mistress Nutter. This was the more unlucky, as through his instrument mentality, Jem and his mother Elizabeth were liberated from the dungeon in which they were placed in Warley Abbey prior to their removal to Lancaster Castle, and none of them have been heard of since, and I hope will never be heard of again, cried Richard, but is Mistress Nutter's retreat secure, think you, may it not be discovered by some of Norwell's emissaries? I trust not, replied Nicholas, but her voluntary surrender is more to be apprehended, for when I last saw her on the night before starting for Myersville, she told me she was determined to give herself over trial, and her motives could scarce be combated, for she declares that unless she submits herself to the justice of man, and expiates her offences, she cannot be 
said she now seems as resolute in good as she was here for resolute in evil. If she perishes thus, her self sacrifice thus it becomes will be Alison's death law cried Richard. So I told her, replied Nicholas, but she continued inflexible. I am born to be the cause of misery to others, and most of those I love most, she said. But I cannot fly from justice. There is no escape for me. She is right, cried Richard. There is no escape for the grave. Whither we are all free, hurrying. A terrible fatality attaches to us. Nay, say not so, they rejoined Nicholas. You are young, and though this shock may be severe, yet when it is past, you will be recompensed. I owe by many years of happiness. I am not be deceived, said Richard. Look me in the face and say honestly, if you think me the longer live, can I do it? I have been smitten by a mortal illness, and am wasting gradually away. I am dying, I feel it, no way. But though it may abridge my return of life, I will purchase present health and spirits at any cost and save Alice. Ah, he exclaimed, putting his hand to his heart with a evil expression of anguish. What is the matter? cried the two gentlemen, greatly alarmed and springing towards him. But the young man could not reply. Another and another agonizing spasm shook his frame, and cold damps broke out on his pallid brow, showing the intensity of his suffering. Nicholas and Sherborne regarded each other anxiously, as if doubtful how to act. Shall I summon assistance? said the latter in a low tone. But softly as the words were uttered, they reached the ears of Richard. Rousing himself by a great effort, he said, On no account the fit is over. I am glad it has seized me now, for I shall not be liable to a recurrence of it throughout the day. Lead me to the window. The air will presently revive me. His friends complied with the request and placed him at the open casement. Great bustle was observable below, and the cause was soon manifest as the chief huntsman, clad in green, with both boots drawn high on the thigh, a horn about his neck, and mounted on a strong black hurdle, rode forth from the stable. He was attended by a noble bloodhound, and on gaining the middle of the court, put his bugle to his lips and blew a loud light call that made the walls ring again. The summons was immediately answered by a number of grooms and pages, leading a multitude of richly caparisoned horses towards the end of the court, where a gallant troop of dames, nobles, and gentlemen, all attired for the chase, awaited them, and where, amidst much mirth and banding of the light, Lively jests and compliments the general mounting to place, the ladies, of course, being placed first on their seats. While this was going forward, the hounds were brought from the kennel in couples, relays having been sent down into the park more than an hour before, and the yard resounded with their joyous baying and neighing of the impatient steeds. By this time, also, the chief huntsman had collected his forces, consisting of a dozen prickers, six habited like himself in green, and six in russet, and all mounted on stout hurdles. Those in green were intended to hunt the heart and those in russet a wild boar, the former being provided with hunting poles, and the latter with spears. Their girdles were well lined with beef and pudding, and each of them, acting upon the advice of worthy master George Turberville, had a stone bottle of good wine at the pommel of his saddle. Beside these, there were a whole horse of arlers of the chase on foot, the chief falconer, with a long winged hawk in her hood, and jesses upon his wrist, was stationed somewhat near the gateway, and close to him were his attendants, each having on his fist a falcon, a gentle, a barbary falcon, and merlin a goose hawk or a sparrow hawk. Thus all was in readiness, and hound hawk and man seemed equally impatient for the sport. At this junction, the door was thrown open by Farrington, who announced Sir John Binnett. It is time, Master Nicholas Ashton, said Master of the Ceremonies. I am ready to attend you, Sir John, replied Nicholas, taking the parchment from his doublet and unfolding it. The petition is well signed. So I see, Sir, replied the knight, glancing at it. Will not your friends come with you? Most assuredly, replied Richard, who had risen on the knight's appearance, and he followed others down the staircase. By direction, of the master of the ceremonies, nearly a hundred of the more important gentlemen of the county had been got together, and this train was subsequently swelled thrice the amount on the extensions it received from persons of inferior rank. When its object came known at the head of this large assembly, Nicholas was now placed, and accompanied by Sir John Binnett, who gave a word to the procession to follow them, he moved slowly up the court, passing through the brilliant crowd of equestrians. The procession halted at a short distance from the doorway of Great Hall, and James, who had been waiting for his throne, which within now came forth and made a cheer and plaudits of the spectators. Sir John Finney then led Nicholas forward, and the latter dropping on one knee said, May it please your majesty, I hold in my hand a petition signed as if you will deign to cast your eyes over it. You will see by many hundreds of the lower orders of your loving subjects in this your county of Lancaster, representing that they are the 
barred from local recreations on Sunday after afternoon service and upon holidays and praying that the restrictions imposed in 1579 by the Earls of Derby and Huntingdon and by William Bishop of Chester, commissioners to her late highness Elizabeth a glorious memory, your majesty's predecessor may be withdrawn. And with this he placed in the king's hands a petition which was very graciously received. The complaint of our loving subjects of Lancashire shall not pass unnoticed, sir, said James. Sorry are we to say that this county of ours is sair invested with all inclining to Puritanism and papistry, both of which sects are adverse to the cause of true religion. Honest mirth is not only tolerable, but praiseworthy, and the prohibition of it is likely to breed discontent, and this our enemies ken few well for when, he continued loudly and emphatically, when shall the common people have leave to exercise, if not upon Sundays and holidays, seeing they must labour and win their living on all other days? Your Majesty speaks like King Solomon himself, observed Nicholas, amid loud cheering. Our will and pleasure then is, pursued James, that our good people be not deprived of any lawful recreation that shall not tend to a breach of the laws or a violation of the curse, but that after the end of divine service they shall not be disturbed, lettered, or discouraged from any lawful recreation as dancing and sick like either of men or women, archery, leaping, vaulting, or any other harmless recreation, nor fray the having of May games with some ales or morris dancing, nor fray setting up of May halls and other sorts there with use, providing the same be had in due and convenient times without impediment or neglect of divine service. And our will further is that women shall have leave to carry rushes to the church for the decorating of it according to old custom. But we prohibit all unlawful games on Sundays, as bear baiting and bull baiting interludes, and by the common for marquee that sir playing at balls. The royal declaration was received loud and reiterated cheers, amidst which James mounted his steed, a large black docile looking charger, and rode out to court, followed by the old calcade. Trumpets were sounded from the battlements as he passed through the gateway, and shouting crowds attended him all the way down the hill, until he entered the avenue leading to the park. At the conclusion of the royal address, the procession, headed by Nicholas, immediately dispersed, and such as meant to join the chase set off in quest of seeds. Foremost amongst these was the squire himself, and on approaching the stables, he was glad to find Richard and Sherborne already mounted, the former holding his horse by the bridle, so that he had nothing to do but on his back. There was an impatience about Richard, very different from his ordinary manner, that surprised and startled him, and the expression of the young man's countenance long afterwards haunted him. Face was deathly pale, except that on either cheek burned a red feverish spot, and the eyes blazed with an unnatural light. So much was the squire struck by his cousin's looks that he would have dissuaded him from going forth, but he saw from his manner that the attempt would fail, while a significant gesture from his brother-in-law told him he was equally uneasy. Scarcely had the principal noble passed through the gateway than, in spite of all efforts to detain him, Richard struck the spurs into his horse and dashed a mist the cavalcade, creating great disorder and rousing the ire of the Earl of Pembroke, to whom the marshalling of the train was entrusted. But Richard paid little heed to his wrath, and perhaps did not hear the angry expressions addressed to him, for no sooner was he outside the gate than, instead of shewing the road down which the king was proceeding, and which was described as hewn out of the rock, he struck into a pit on the right, and in defiance of all attempts to stop him, and at the imminent risk of breaking his neck, rode down the precipitous side of the hill, and reaching the bottom in safety, long before the royal cavalcade had attended the same point, took the direction apart. His friends watched him commence this perilous descent in dismay, but though much alarmed, they were unable to follow him. Poor lad, I am fearful he has lost his senses, said Sherborne. He is what the king would call fair, and not long for this world, replied Nicholas, shaking his head.